today's guest is here. Just doing a bit of snapper fishing. Now, the crucial thing is to find the right area, so keep an eye on that sounder. We're looking for where the gravel meets the reef, in and around bait schools, fishing those contours and those ramps. They're the, they're the spots to fish. Whether you're bait fishing or, like me, soft plastic fishing at the moment, they're the gun areas. And I'll, just to prove to you that it works, <laughs> oh, actually, I'll put the net under this one. Check that out. That's a seriously nice fish. And that's all about fishing those areas. As I said, it's about contours, it's about structure, it's about bait. Have a look at your sounder. When you see those fish, get those really good sounder returns, um, especially on your down scan. That gives you, you know, if you see your bait on your conventional sounder picture, then you've got your down scan with that fish reveal. And if you have a look at my sounder, I've got that white fish reveal. It'll show these as those arches. You'll see those swim bladders. You know the snapper are there. And it's just a matter of working out how you're gonna catch them. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another Sonar Masterclass. Thanks to Lorance. And we're here today with uh, Michael Guest. And Guesty, we've had a few um, little technical glitches, a couple of uh, tech, tech gun bits with no, uh, no teenage kids to help us out, mate. But we um, we eventually overcame them. And we're here 10 minutes late. But nonetheless, we are here. So thanks for coming along, mate. Oh, no, to it's that. great to be here. I was going to go and get a bottle of Glenfiddich and knock the top off it and just <laughs> pour some ice and all that. You could get what you're, you're in Queensland, a bottle of rum for you. And we could just we could just have a toast over 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 uh, over the internet. But uh, we've made it. It's good. Sorry we, about that. We, I don't know what we, to go we did make it. And, and folks, if you're uh, listening in, apologies for the late start. Let us know that you can hear us okay because we have had a few techie issues. Uh, and so just put a, something in the chat there. Let us know that you can hear us. Let us know where you're coming from and what your interests are. We're going to be talking snapper today, but you know, Guesty knows a few things about a few other species as well. So feel free to fire questions. And you know, we might talk a little bit about sonar. We're going to talk a little bit about fishing. And, you know, all good on the audio it says Crazy88. Excellent stuff. Thanks, mate, for letting us know. It's always hard, Guesty, when we're sitting here and we can see that there's about 60-odd oh, people in, in the audience, but we don't know if they can hear us. So <laughs> appreciate that. All right. No, good stuff. Let's start by having a bit of a chat about um, you know, what's going on on the snapper scene over the next um, couple of months. You know, we're coming into last week of or last month of, of uh, spring and then into summer, mate. What happens on the New South Wales central coast in terms of snapper fishing at that time of year? Yeah, definitely things tend to change up a little bit. Um, I reckon what, you, what you'll find is you'll get, get a quite a good bite now before we get that run of really warm water. Or that's the one thing that tends to slow that inshore bite bite down a fair bit. Um, they tend to go a bit deeper and, and hold where there's more of a constant sort of water temperature and a bit slightly cooler temperature. Snapper are not massive fans of 26 and a half degree mm. macro water is not their thing. You'll still catch them in that water, but but they do like that sort of 19 or 17 and a half to 21 degrees. They're really happy and 19 degrees is really good snapper water. So I think anywhere you can get that 19, 19 or 20 degree water, you'll find that, that the snapper bite changes up and down the coast, depending a little bit on that water temperature inshore as well. So for us, this time of year, um, just hitting November, we'll still get a pretty good run. And and you'll find you might even you might even find if, for example, Southwest Rocks gets a really good push of warm water, you know, in past Hat Head into that sort of Port Macquarie area, then places just down the road, Lauriton, Crowdy Head, you know, um, Foster Seal Rocks, Port Stevens, that, that run will be be quite quite good in that area as well as that real warm water pushes down the snapper tend to move up and down and in and out a little bit as well mm, excellent so uh yeah all, all good stuff and it means of course if they're out in deeper water you need to know how to use your sounder well and that's what we're going to cover of course tonight so folks the uh, the idea of these master classes is that you fire us questions they can be sonar questions they can be just general fishing questions and uh, so we, we welcome any questions, fire them through. We will answer them as we go along. But, Michael, you've got a couple of screenshots to work through. So let's maybe put one of those up to get the conversation started, shall we? Yeah, for sure. All yes. righty. So, so that's, that's uh, a, a, well, like a triple screenshot. So you can see that there's... Um, there's GPS there, some GPS marks on a little bit of a bit of a contour, a little bit of a reef edge there. And and so that's that's um conventional the conventional digital sonar picture in the middle and then down scan on the outside. So and you can see there's a column of bait and, and how that column of bait is actually sort of coned up. Um, so what I'm looking for there, and one of the reasons why I, I don't mind having that that, sh that shot there, and fish I actually didn't have fish reveal wasn't on in that 
in that shot either. So um, that cone, that cone of bait. So you can see it's quite shallow water there. Just off to the side, um, there's there's a bigger snapper up quite high in the water column there. If you can see that just on the right of screen, and and it's that. Right yeah, yeah, that so that one there, and you can see it if you look on the edge of the down scan, um, you can see it just coming into frame there. So that 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 was actually quite a big fish. We caught a couple of big snapper off that bait school, but you can see how that bait's retracted and moved away from that predatory fish coming in. So that's a big snapper. The bait below, if you look on that um, on on the digital picture there, you can see that bait below is quite tight tightly packed. So that fish has come across that bait. That bait's compressed on the bottom, and the bait. Um, towards the direction that big fish is moving is actually bent away and moving away so they're the sort of things that you when you see that on your on your sounder i'm excited about that so when you see just standard like a bait school that's not being um, harassed in any way it's all great to have bait on the sounder but if the fish aren't there it makes it pretty hard to catch them so yeah. so that's a great fish that fish i reckon we caught that fish um that's why i've got it on there i reckon we actually caught that fish about 90 centimeter snapper so really quite a big one yeah and and we marked a few that day in and around there in that midwater column why why am i confident that we caught that fish uh, is the fact that um we we actually drifted over that so got that set sonar reading i saw that fish turned around cast back at it and it was only six meters under the water and let it sink down you know uh, soft plastic sinking down through the water column bang got the bite caught the 90 centimeter fish so i was one of those lucky ones that's why i took the screenshot at the time and man there's a good fish we've gone past it and generally, when you're soft plastic fishing for snapper, you're always using the wind and the drift to sneak up on the fish. And that's one of those rare occasions where I actually back cast. It's like flop back in fly fishing terms. But I back cast at it, sunk it down, free spool it down, and ate the soft plastic, and, and there's the result. That's why I do like that screenshot. But it just shows you how that bait, how, A, it's compressed underneath that predatory fish you can see down on that 10 metre line there. So so that bait's really balled up and saying, man, we, we, we don't like you. And you can see the other baits pushed up and away, just trying to keep their distance away from that big snapper. Yeah. And as you say, you know, if the bait are not worried, they're going to be less tightly packed and they're going to be, you know, it's going to be a reasonably round ball, generally speaking. When you've got sharp edges like that, yeah. you know that something's pushing them around. Yeah, definitely. And look, Greg, one of the, the probably the biggest things, if you go to the next, if you got, you've got another screenshot. Yeah, I, this, is, this is going to be a bit random, mate, because one of the things we're going to do before I'm we off random. Random's good. Let's go. Let's go fully let's random. what comes up and you can tell me. Oh, well, there's. There, is that a 90 centimetre no, fish? No, that's a 90 no. centimetre fish as well. That's not the one I caught, but that was about, on the. No, 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 no. They're all just showing off. <laughs> this is the shot that I wanted to see. Okay. This is the one I wanted okay. to see. But um, that 90 centimetre fish, I think we caught that one the same day. But but the greatest thing, one of the greatest things I reckon is that fish reveal and down scan. And this is a classic shot to show you um, just what you get out of that. And I, I love this one here because, once again, if you look over to the to the left hand side there um, in the conventional sound of picture in the digital up the top there so that's a column of bait so that's a classic column of bait and it's not till you come straight down below into the down scan and if you go to the left see that white fish reveal that's a snapper there and and you can see that bait is pushing away and up away from that snapper mm. so so they they're, they're the markings they're the showings that's the readings that i really want to see as a snapper fisherman and then if you go back to the right um, with the fish reveal you can see more snapper those fish were i didn't get any fish over 70 centimeters out of there but they were between 50 and 70 centimeters all quality fish so that's them stacked down below the bait and then right across to the next bait school you can see a couple of bigger fish on the bottom longer style arches um, i reckon they might have been a couple of mulloways sitting there um, mm. those ones that are back across to the right but the snapper are these ones that are sitting up just up a little bit above the bottom, um, uh, just in front of that that spire of bait, and then back down over that reefy edge, and then there are a couple of bigger fish sitting there, which I reckon could have been Mulloway up against that bait there. But that's that down scan is so good, and, and you'll get pictures where where we talk about inactive bait schools or bait schools that are blacking your screen out, and when you get your your fish reveal right, you'll actually see those predatory fish, those big snapper in amongst the bait. Mm. And at times I've seen them and you can see them amongst the bait and you might be two or three hours from a tide change in the middle of the day. And everyone 
tends to relax a little bit, I reckon, under sea. You, you know, I know when I've been diving and I've seen snapper, everyone's cruising around, we're all happy and friendly, and then all of a sudden you'll see that bait either push up and away, push down, and the predators come back, and, and once those snapper go into feeding zone, the shape of your bait changes, and that's a really big thing to keep an eye out for. It's not just a fine bait, but what's the bait doing? Is it under pressure? I reckon that's a big one. So. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got a couple of questions come through, um, Gesty, so I might bring mm -hmm. one of those up. So, Sorry, I got, I got a bit carried away there, mate. I love talking no, about No, no. <laughs> we, we, we encourage you to get carried away because you might yeah, be yeah. tips. So, um, Dale's asking us, mate, for tips for looking for ground while travelling at speed. So his sounder picks up bottom at 30-plus knots but he's not too sure what to look for. Yeah, so um, structure's a key. So um, we're talking snapper at the moment, but um, but generally we're looking for structure and then the edge of that structure. So so you've got a bit of a reef that, that where that gravel or sand meets the edge of the reef, that's generally the places to be fishing for. But I do the exact same thing. You'd be flying along and um, is it Dale, is it an ex-rally driver? Mm -hmm. Mine reads the bottom at 43 knots with the one kilowatt transducer. So if we're having a competition there, I reckon I've got him, but that's all right. But <laughs> but, but I, I the great thing about now, I, with, with the 16-inch lives that I run, is I can put my cursor on on that reef pinnacle and then flag it straight away, mark it at speed, which is fantastic. And uh, the other week I was fishing some new ground out of Loriton. So I, I was out of there and, and took a track that I had never done before and in 70 metres and I was – Busy to get out wider and go and chase some kingfish actually on a mark. And driving out there, I went, wow, like, and that speed, when you get those marks that mark, you know, because you're going so quick, you get this really rip tearing mark. But when you slow down and have a look at it, it breaks out. But this was a really good looking pinnacle at speed, really tall. So I flagged it in and then on the way back, I thought, I'll have a look at that, Greg. So came back, had a look drove around, spent some time sounding it, saw a really good face edge that faced the north where the with the current hitch pressure point. Sure enough, there was some snapper sitting there. So so definitely, definitely I'm I'm forever finding things and looking for things. And I reckon some of the greatest spots that are in my um, in my uh, GPS unit are ones where I've I've found them myself when I've been trolling for marlin or I'm just having a look around. I've gone those little bumps that you find, those little lumps, those mm. little pinnacles in the middle of nowhere can be just awesome. Yep, yep, absolutely. And often you might see some bait sitting above them as well. That can be an indication. Sometimes yep. as you're scooting along, you'll see bait, and if you yep. stop and look underneath, there's, there's a bit of structure there, and that's why the bait's there. So, 100%. great question. So, um, Lance asked a question a bit earlier on about uh, his, his sound has just died. What's a good sounder to get to replace it? And I asked him for a little bit more information. He said that he does a mix of all sorts of fishing, but mainly offshore up to 100 metres, game fishing, and some estuary. Yeah, okay. Well, the three-in-one transducers that we use now with um, with um, you know, down scan, side scan, and, and, and obviously your conventional sound of picture, they're pretty good right up to that 100 metres. They're unbelievably good in the shallow. So that picture that we were looking at earlier, that's AI three-in-one, which is what you get when you buy uh, any of the elite units or a, or a live unit, which is what I'm, I, I use the live units. So that, that will work really well. Once you're getting out, you know, way deeper than that again, then you can start looking at a one kilowatt transducer or, or a different transducer. So I, I would suggest, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about what screen size will fit on your boat and what your budget is. But um, anything either, you know, you know, for me personally, I, I love the live units, so I have a touch screen, I love the glass edge, um, but some of the new Elite FS stuff is just, it's just as fantastic and it has the same options anyway. So, so it's really a budget situation and work out what, what sort of dollars you've got to spend, how, you know, the bigger the screen size you go, then the more dollars it's going to cost you as well. So. Yeah. And also the more battery it's going to use. That's the other thing to keep in mind, Guesty, yeah. is if you, uh, you're you running a big screen, you're going to use battery faster. So, you know, if you're uh, motoring around on a, a trolling motor and you're running your sonar, a smaller screen can actually uh, extend the life of your battery. So, 100%, yeah. Ian McKay is asking, I haven't used split screen yet on sonar. Will I be able to adjust both screens independently? And then will I be able to share the split screen and down screen on a shared screen? Right. Wow. That's <laughs> that's quite a convoluted question. Yes, you can adjust both of them. Um, simply with, with touchscreen, once you're working, if you're working on one screen or another, you just tap on that screen and then that'll bring, you can bring the menu bar up on the side and adjust uh, either screen that you want to adjust. That's no drama. So, so you can left, definitely do that. And as far as, I'm just trying to understand his question with the shared screen, talking about 
sharing that screen with so on the shared screen is he talking about another sounder so if he's got a bow mount sounder working off his off his main one split screen and down scan perhaps give us a little bit more info if you would yeah, yeah, in. We'll clarify info, exactly yeah. what you're asking there and we'll we'll come but back you can, to that you can definitely adjust adjust them as he goes and with any of those touch screen touch that one you can adjust that one to suit so yeah yeah now we've got a question from um, Jono here, mate. I'm not sure whether we should bring it up. I reckon there's this is a bit of a uh, an in-house joke here, as my guess. But uh, uh, Jono does the podcast with me, and yeah. he's absolutely taking the Mickey there, and he'll, yeah. he'll be in trouble tomorrow <laughs> when I catch up with him. And that jig head selection on Shallow Reefs is going to take ages for chasing snapper, but but it's a real simple one if you're uh, if you if you're casting. And your lure's not sinking, you're too light. And if you're casting and it's hitting the bottom, you're catching rock cod, you're too heavy. So pick one in between there somewhere. That's pretty funny. <laughs> but, but, but Snapper, can I just say, Snapper love, absolutely love presentations that waft down through the water column. So so for me, if I'm, if I'm Snapper soft plastic fishing in, in uh, say, 15 metres of water, I gener I'm generally starting and I've got, 10 knots of breeze pushing me along. I'm starting around that quarter ounce with a seven inch soft plastic, so somewhere around there. Yeah, I'm going to bring up that screenshot again, mate, because it illustrates that point nicely. Look where that snapper's sitting. It's not down near the bottom. It's uh, it's sitting at around about six metres in 12 metres of water. So, you know, you want your lure wafting around there. If it goes down below that fish, well, there may be other fish down there, but you're going to miss that one. That's And I think people... Mis misunderstand just how pelagic snapper are you know they, for a long time i think we all thought that they were demersal species they're always down near the bottom but they're not they'll come right up the water column to feed so that's why you don't want to go too heavy with your jig head absolutely we were snapper soft plastic fishing uh i do a fair bit of it and as you know i've done a lot of it over the years but uh not last was it last year i think um we were doing some filming and suddenly had all these blow-ups on the surface i went oh i'll grab the stick bait rod it'll be a kingfish you know and so this big buff of, of uh, white water and then oh, another one, another one. Anyway, yeah. we're all looking at it. And here's this big red and silver tail comes out of the water and it was a 20-pound snapper on the surface and they were busting up some cuttlefish right on the surface. Like it was amazing to see that. Um, so, yeah, and, and I've, I've caught them mid-north coast on metal jigs, casting chromies around, cast the chromie out before I could even put the bail arm open you know six kilo snappers eating it off the surface so they will come especially during those low light periods and the tide changes they will come up so high in the water column and i think that's the first thing that um as a sport fisherman you need to get your head around that and that totally changes the way that you fish so hmm. absolutely so there's a bit of banter going on here <laughs> what size you get to catch Jono? Because we need to throw him back. Oh, 100%. He's a definite <laughs> throwback. So that's all right. So we'll, we'll move on. Hey, so Ian, Ian's back again. So. Okay. So Ian's asking. Let's see. Let's see. Ian's into some clarification. So thanks, mate. I know how to get the sharing of the down screen, et cetera. But if I use the split screen for normal and close to the bottom with sonar, will this share with down screen as three images? Yeah, uh, yes. So you just need to select the pages in his menu and he can set up whatever whatever page setup he wants. You know, you go in there and you can go edit, I'll create this page. So then you'd have a down scan page and you can actually select two sonar pages and you can create one one as a split screen, one as a conventional and one as one as uh, a down scan page as well. So mm. Mm, excellent. I feel that answers the question there. So. All right. And if not, send us another message, Ian. We're happy to keep going until we get you an answer. So Crazy 88. So I normally leave my sounder pinging all the time. Is there much advantage to stopping it while drifting along with a line in? Uh, I, I, I don't turn mine off. <laughs> I don't turn mine off. Um, there's a few schools of thought, you know, that does it scare the fish? I, I Look, I don't think so. I, I'm forever leaving mine on. I want to see what's underneath the water. That's why I've got it in there for. And quite often, um, snapper fishing, and when you're drifting and casting, we're talking about soft plastic fishing at the moment, but um, you might find that your mate hooks a fish and you're netting it and you're busy and he's fighting a fish. Well, wow. And then you look at the sound and go, oh, my God, look at the fish we just drifted over. So then I'll, you know, we've drifted over those. We haven't started the engine, haven't made any noise, but I'll, I'll go and flag that, hit the GPS, flag those fish. Uh, a, my mates hooked a fish. B, there were some bigger fish sitting there. And then we'll go right back around, line that drift up again and have another run and and hopefully get a cast into those fish. Because sometimes you can miss them, and especially with modern um, rods and reels, you can you can get a cast in that goes 60, 
70 metres, like a massive big long cast, you know, 50 metres with the wind assisted cast. So you could easily cast over some some snapper. So you miss that one. So then you go back and have another drift. So, but at least if you've got the sounder going, um, I'll see a patch of bait, see some fish sitting around it. So, well, look, I don't think I got my lure in the right spot there. So let's go back around and have another crack. So, yeah, I leave my sounder going. I don't think it makes any difference whatsoever as far as the fishing goes. But I, I definitely, yeah, I like to leave it on. And you find all sorts of other things while it's going too, Greg. So. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if you have a think about what frequency the uh, the ping from a sounder is and then do a bit of research on what frequencies are actually audible to a fish, uh, technically and theoretically, fish can't hear the sound of a, uh, of a sonar. Right. But, I knew you were here for a reason. That's a great, that's awesome. So, Greg, yeah. you can just answer the questions from there. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. But in saying that, look, I leave mine on all the time if I'm in deeper water, but I, I turn it off in shallow water. Um, if, I'm, if I don't need it, I'll turn it off. And I don't think it actually makes any difference, to be perfectly honest, but it's one of those things that just makes me feel a little bit more confident. Yep. <laughs> so that's why I hey, do it. What, so. whatever, whatever works, whatever makes you feel better. But, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm probably the opposite. I leave it running, like, all the time. Okay. So it's a pretty cool thing when – and I, I did some uh, – I was doing a real action show. I've forgotten that we've done that many shows now, but uh, in the last couple of years. And and uh, I had this big spotted mackerel under the boat with snapper fishing, and it was about five or six metres under the boat. It came up at one point saw it. I knew it was there. Anyway, so – so it's sound, sound is going, and I looked and I thought, oh, there it is there. I can see it under the right, like right under the transducer. So I had a light slimy mackerel in the tank, hooked it up, dropped it down. We watched it on the sound. I swim down and then watched the watched the slimy swim down through the transducer beam and then watched the, the, the spotted mackerel eat. It was a really big spotted mackerel, about eight or nine kilos, and, and ate it and, and shot off. And that was just amazing to see that. So um, different times I've been... I've been um, fishing and burling for snapper in, in the warmer months, like doing some bait fishing. And then all of a sudden you'll see a big Spanish mackerel swimming around under there. And then I pulled out a live bait or a stick bait rod or something and managed to catch that fish. If I was sitting there without my sounder on, I wouldn't have known that fish was there in the first place. So, mm. yeah, I, don't know. I, I, I think there's more advantages than disadvantages. That's my thoughts. So. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think if you look at, you know, the, the latest advances in sonar, of course, are the live sonar. And, you know, if, if fish were put off by the sound of sonar, you're not going to see them with the live sonar scanning yeah. ahead as, you, as you're moving towards them. So it's a pretty good indication Definitely. that they're swimming up through your sonar beam and taking a lure. They're not too perturbed by the sound of it. So. No, 100%. I think there's uh, there's probably a little bit of scientific and anecdotal evidence to suggest that. Hey, mate, let's put up another screenshot. I think this is our last of your um, of your screenshot slides, apart from your brag shots. And I will show those later because you know you've got to show your brag shots every opportunity. So, talk to us about what's uh, what's going on here, mate. This looks yeah. similar to the previous one, except with with a chart. Yeah. So the difference is, I think one of the big things there um, that, that I, I think about with snapper is is the areas I want to target. So if you look at the um, uh, at the GPS there and the contours. So the prevailing conditions that I'm fishing in in on that day were uh, were a northwesterly breeze. So that's why the drifts are coming from from uh, left to right on that angle. But there was some tide pushing downhill. So if you have a look at where I've spent most of my time fishing on both of those edges, it's 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 well, on that front edge especially. Hmm. It's what we call a ramp. So so the deeper water is um, back up to the to the uh, where I've sort of run around on the on the edge of there, and then you've got this ramp coming up, and that light blue section is the real real shallow part of the reef. So I noticed I haven't even drifted, I haven't even been right over that real shallow section, but the fish was sitting right on that what, what I call the ramp. So it's a ramp where it goes from that gravelly sandy bottom up to that hard reef, and that's yep. where I where I, I did most of my drifting. And if you have a look at at the runaround points where I've turned around, so I've drifted through, and then you notice I'm not driving back up the same line. I'm going back to the north, doing a big loop, turning the engine off, and then drifting back through nice and quietly. And that that stealth factor for snapper, for big fish, I don't think that can be underestimated. So driving back over the fish in shallow water, I, yeah, I'm not a fan of that at all. I, I I think it's you know much more in your event, you know, to your advantage to go take take a bit more time. Do that loop around, start your drift again, and then run back down and through. So that's that's an important part, um, you know, looking at those GPS lines there. And you'll see a few marks where I've marked fish and caught fish. But but um, with the with the sounder running, once again, um, I extended on that next run down. I would normally stop at the back of the reef on the bottom part and then go back around. But that day, I can remember 
distinctly going through there. Once I got off the bottom edge of it, there was a few fish sitting there as well. We caught a couple. So leaving the sander on once again, I saw those fish just as I was about to start the engine and, and kill the drift and go again. Oh, hang on, a few more. Let's go a bit further. Do you know what I mean? Oh, there's a bit more bait there. And then suddenly, oh, there's another bump there that I didn't really know was there. And you mark that one in as well. And, um, yeah, once again, you can see that sounder shot there. It's a classic one with, um, you know, when you look at, look at uh, down scan there, that's one that we did look at earlier with those fish sitting in around the bait. And that's that you're seeing that on your sounder, whether you're going to going to move upstream from there and set up a burly trail and feed some baits back, or you're going to drift over that with some soft plastics, then you know that you're in for a you know, pretty good time there once you get your, your, um, your bait or your presentation in the right spot. The only thing I will say, just remember – that's over a quite a short distance. So you could put a cast in with a soft plastic lure, hook one of those fish. But when you look on the sounder, there was other fish stacked up on the other side. So that, once again, drift over there, go back around and have another run through there because it wasn't just one fish sitting there. So. Mm. Mm. No, good stuff. And uh, a really good point looking for that, you know, that that gradient and then the gravel on the on the downslope side of that reef is generally where they're sitting, isn't it, with the snapper? D definitely. They're sitting on top. No, no, where that current's pushing, and, and you'll find, like, all they're no different to any other predatory fish. They're generally at the top end of the reef. So if the tide's running downhill, you want to be at the, you know, it's running from north to south, you want to be at the northern end. If it's running downhill, if you've got uphill current, then you'll generally find the fish are stacked on that bottom end as well. Uh, they, you know, they're, they're no different than any other fish. They want to sit with their head in the current. They, they want to be the first, the, the fish that gets the first opportunity for that next bait school that comes through or whatever's coming down the line, so. Yeah, yeah. And when you're drifting, guest, are you using a drogue or a sea anchor or anything like that? Are you just drifting at whatever pace the wind and tide are, are carrying you? Yeah, I, I used to use a sea anchor a lot, um, but generally I, I actually prefer windier days. Like, So if I'm snapper soft plastic fishing, if it's real calm, then I'll, I'll put the big electric motor down and, and electric down. But, but anything up to sort of that that 18 knots is pretty good and i'll go to a slightly heavier jig head if i need to but i like the self factor i snap i love a bit of a rough up you know they're they're they're, they're big fans of a bit of a rough up but a sea anchor mounted midship somewhere there to keep the boat nice and nice and side on is a really good thing but i don't generally deploy that until after about you know 20 knots and up so if it's real windy i'll put it out there so and i'm assuming you're casting ahead of the drift and then floating the floating the lure down and then working it back through absolutely and and you know, I've been really lucky that I've caught, oh, I don't know, I can't remember how many big snapper, I've caught a lot of big snapper on soft plastics, been very lucky to have done a lot of that. But I would have to say that 95% of those big fish are on a full cast, like on that big cast. So get that, fire that big cast out, click the bail arm over, stay in contact with that braid. And as it's, as it's you know, as it's sinking, you might give it a couple of twitches, but that lure is wafting down through, that's when that. You know, that, that's when those big fish hit most of the time. It's, it's not that often that you catch one. Uh, in shallow water, I'm talking about, like deeper water, I've got plenty of fish straight under the boat. But in that shallow water, and I'm talking, you know, eight metres to 20 metres, generally it's a big long cast. That's where most of those big fish yeah, come from. Yeah. So. And then hang on when you hook him up. So that's the, that's the fun part of it. So. That, that's all part of that stealth that you were talking about earlier. Yeah, so, yeah. Ian's got another question. Uh, can you talk me through how to turn on fish reveal on downscan? And what brings up the message in Downscan stopped on Elite FS, which happened on Monday? Right. <laughs> Ian, you're a winner with the questions, brother. There's no doubt about that. So um, talk me through fish reveal on Downscan. So, yeah, once you get into your Downscan, or I don't have the unit in front of me, so I'm just going off memory here. Once you get into Downscan, you've got your palette choices, and you can simply turn fish reveal on or off. So obviously you want fish reveal on. That's one of the great parts of having that X-ray vision that you get with Downscan. So I turn it on. It's up to you to pick what palette you want. I do like, as you can see, that sort of that, that uh, bronzy, that dark sort of bronzy colour with the white fish reveal. I think the white stands out really, really well. Um, so that's my choice. So you can mix and match the palette. I've got mates who use you know, different colours, blue backgrounds and, and other fish and yellow fish reveal options, but I do like the white because it's so contrasting against that dark background. So that's how you turn that on and off. And then what was the next part of that question again, Greg? Something about the next something. Part was you had a problem with the Elite FS telling him that the down scan had stopped. Uh, well, he's probably accidentally touched the stop button. So there's, if you have a look at your menu on the side, you can stop your sonar at any point. So if you want to, you go, oh, what's going off the screen there? You can simply, you can generally push your finger on the screen and just slide it back if you want to, but you can stop the sonar. So you can push stop sonar on there. So I'd say he's probably bumped, the, bumped it if you're mucking around with big fat fingers and 
bumping around in the ocean or somewhere, I'd say maybe you just touch stop and then you've just got to hit that button again and it will become action and live and away it goes again. So. Yeah, good stuff. I guess we're, we're out of screenshots, but I'm going to put up some of those brag photos oh. now. Yeah, we've got to go through those. So it's nine centimetre fish. Tell us the story of this fish, mate. How was it caught? Yeah, so that, that's a funny one, that, that one, actually. I was filming Real Action um, and I had Sammy Hitsky with me, actually, that day. Sammy and Barney were out and uh, fishing the mid-north coast. Beautiful day, as you can see in the background, but right on the new moon. And, um, and uh, I think people forget that in the ocean, um, that, that prawns are just such a big part of the diet of a lot of fish. And we think of snapper eating yellowtail and slimy mackerel and, and you know, chewing on things that get busted up after a big swell. But they're a big they, – they eat a lot of big king prawns in and around the new moon at certain times of the year. So this was right on the new moon. Um, I knew they'd be in shallow and and I was using those – like a big prawn shape, actually the Berkeley, um, Berkeley king shrimp, the real big one. So throwing those around and um, – and, and Sammy actually, Sammy Hitsky, his PB snapper, I don't know what it was at the time, 60, 70 centimetres, and he said he wanted to catch a real big one. Well, we got him on a 90 centimetre one first fish. So he's pretty happy. It was on, we had it on the show. Barney caught one about the same, 88, 89, 90 centimetres, somewhere around there. It was we're having a cracking day. And then I'd, I'd sort of missed out. And then I was looking at the GPS, and when we, once again, we drifted through and we're catching all these fish on this ramp onto this ridge. And, um, uh, I said to the guys, this is my turn, this is the cast. And I caught a couple of smaller fish. And I said, this is the cast. That should land right where these fish were sitting on the ridge. And sure enough, bang, I've got the bite and this thing smoked off. And then and uh, when, I, when, when I got the bite, I hit it really hard. And I think what had happened is, is the jig head had slipped out of its mouth. And I actually hooked it up near the bump. So it was hooked in the side, this fish. So so we've got this fish on and we've netted and fought a couple of fish around that 90 centimetre mark, which is a big snapper. And uh, and this thing that I've hooked, it's going like an absolute train, you know. And um, and I'm thinking this is like the 12 kilo one. This is the monster one. This is the unicorn snapper, a huge one. And it's because I was pulling it sideways through the water, plus going like a train. So when we brought it up, the boys reckon it didn't count that fish, so that actually that fish doesn't count because I jagged it in the side. I didn't actually hook that one in the mouth. So, so but that was one of those fantastic days, and and electronics played a huge part in the success of catching those fish that day. Yeah, yeah. Take them any way you can, mate. Doesn't matter where you. Yeah. Are. Hey, I'm, I'm winning that one. This is a cool photo. I like this photo um, just because it's a great picture of a snapper. It's not. You know, the Blake holding it's a pretty ordinary looking fella, but the snapper, it's a really pretty picture of the snapper. And um, this was just after um, all the flood water we had um, earlier this year. So we had truckloads of of, uh, of flood water, dirty, dirty flood water. And I, 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 it was as chocolate brown as you'd ever see it um, uh, down, down our way. And I went up the coast and we kept traveling up the coast, traveling up the coast. And then we finally found this point where the flood water stopped and there was a bit of it wasn't, I wouldn't say clean. You can see in the background, the water's still fairly ordinary, but it was greenish, clean water. It looked clean compared to anything compared to the mud was hitting that flood water. And we were catching these fish. A, I've got, I've got a lot of lot going on there. I've got structure behind me. You can see the, mm. see the rocky headland behind me. We've got white water. They love sitting under the white water. And we had this fantastic color change right there. So it was where that clean green water was hitting that flood water and the snapper fishing was just unbelievably good. There was by a cast throwing soft plastics in underneath that. It looks like a place where um, you might want somebody on the helm all the time, mate, while you're fishing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping you actually, no, no, if you have a look at the screen, like... screen, Greg, it's all good. It's safe. And I've actually got a bum bag life jacket on there before someone writes in and says I've got a life jacket on. <laughs> so I do copy yeah. that. But you'll see the top of the Minco, the electric motor sitting yeah. there. So we're yeah. spotlocked. So we're in the safe zone. So it was breaking – over my back, over my shoulder, and then we're in the deep water putting a big long cast in. So, so yeah. thanks for the tips, Greg, but we were safe there, mate. It was all good, so. Excellent. All right, we've got a, another comment from Tilla Gorilla. So what's the best line class? So fishing goes reefs in 20 metres or so, especially uh, the hard fish reefs, I guess, or, yeah, or fishing yeah. hard reefs. Yeah, so I think when you say fishing, the, the reefs that are getting a bit of fishing pressure, I, I think yeah. the lighter you can get away with, there's no doubt, um, I've fished some, you know, gone down to a 15 pound leader. You could go down, you know, I wouldn't want to go any lighter than that. You'll land the, this size fish, great fun on 10 pound leader and, and 6 pound braid. You can, you'll can you have a ball on them, but you hook that fish that's five or six kilos, and man, that's taken some serious stopping in that shallow water. 
generally, 20 pound fluorocarbon is a, a rod length of fluorocarbon is absolutely essential. So, 20 pound fluorocarbon leader is where I start, and 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 around that sort of 15 pound braid is really good on a seven foot six, six to ten kilo rod, four thousand size spin reel. That's a snap of plastic outfit right there for me. And then um, I will go up heavier than that. Um, if I've got some places where it's really ugly and shallow and I know some big fish are hanging out, I might go to um, some 20-pound braid, 30-pound fluorocarbon leader. And, uh, man, you, if you know how to fish, you can pull really hard on that sort of tackle as well. And even a slightly heavier rod, like an 8 to 15-kilo rod, that sort of outfit, um, you can you can pull really hard on that. So that's a great place to start, but that 6 to 10, 15-pound um, braid, 20-pound fluorocarbon leader and a quarter-ounce jig head, that's a, that's a really good place to start. Yeah, cool. Now, we've got another question coming through. I'm going to show the last of your photos, mate, and then mm -hmm. we'll get back to the questions yep. and, and then we'll start to wrap up. So tell us a story of this one. Got a nice soft plastic hanging out its mouth. Looks like a uh, paddle tail there. Yeah, so the, so there's there's a few different profiles. and I've already spoken about using those creature baits, the big, the big um, prawn-style lures. So that one's a paddle tail. And then the, the one that, you know, that kicked things off years ago for us, what well, well, we actually started catching them on. Mr. Twisters and Cocoho Minnows, and then we went to we went to uh, to uh, Power Bait, and then Gulp. Once Gulp came out, that was the end of everything. But yeah. Gulp's just unbelievable. But seven inch jerk shads and five inch jerk shads and nine inch jerk shads, you've, you've got you've got to really you know crack some action into them. They sort of glide down. The great thing about paddle tails and, and big curly tailed soft plastics is they swim down so well. So I actually mm. like them quite lightly rigged, and I like throwing them in behind me into the wash because they've got this fantastic swimming motion down and and you can use even a slightly heavier jig head in them at times because they have a slower sink rate so if you've got a curly tail it creates you know hyd you know hydrodynamic friction through the water or a paddle tail so it will slow the sink rate down where if you've got a long slender you know a lure like a jerk shad it has a quicker sink rate so so i can get a bit more hang time if that's the right way to put it so casting in to the rocky faces where it can be a bit ugly and shallow and I want the lure to sit there a bit longer. I do like those paddle tail lures because they have that slower swimming action and then as the wave sucks back and draws, the lure will actually swim around itself a bit without you having to really work it too hard. So. Mm, excellent. All right, that's it for the screenshots, mate. I'm going to, I'm going to oh. turn them off. <laughs> Loving the screenshots. <laughs> well, yeah, that's all right. So we've got some good questions coming through, though. Let's... Um, yeah. So, so David's um, asking us about, he's got a Navman 4507. Is there a way to uh, use an adapter cable to replace that unit without having to change his transducer? Right. I have no idea, really. No, <laughs> you mean? No, I don't know much about, uh, I must admit I've been with Lawrence for such a long time. I'm, I'm quite okay. You know, I'm not the greatest technical person. I'm, I like fishing and hunting and driving cars fast, but I, but I, I, I'm pretty good with, with that. So, so I'm not too sure. And that's something that I'd get on and have a bit of a Google search and say, hey, can I get an adapter cable for this? Sorry, man, I, 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 I don't really have a, a, a fair dink of answer for that one. So. Yeah, or, or David, just jump onto the um, Lawrence Facebook page and ask those guys leave a message for them. I'm sure that um, they'll be more than happy to get back to you and let you know what yeah. can or can't be done. All right. This is the last question, guys. So if, you, if you're if you sitting on a question, you haven't asked it yet, now's the time to do it. So um, do you adjust your frequency much, mate, when you're getting into 80 to 100 metres of water? Yes. Yes, I do. So I, I would probably bring medium chirp into play there. Um, yeah, just – and I, I think it um, depends on what transducer you're running. I'm lucky where I've got um, – once I get to 80 to 100, I'd bring the one kilowatt transducer into play. The picture's just – dynamite there um 80 to 100 that's pretty well the end of down scans finish there anyway you're a little bit too deep for down scan side scan certainly um so in that snapper fishing you're really relying on that digital sound of the conventional sound of picture that you're using so in the three and one which works fine in that depth absolutely use the three and one all the time there but i generally i generally go uh i stick to the 200 but i i just go to well in that sort of 200 as long as i can and then go to medium chirp um and then you get a high chirp if you go even deeper but medium chirp for me works pretty good there and you need to experiment everybody's boats will be different transducer positions are a bit different and you'll you'll, you'll you've just got to play around don't be afraid to um to jump in there and have a bit of a play around i, I was on a uh, mate's boat this morning. Caught a nice mulloway on a vibe this morning. Just throwing that out there. I didn't. But mate, mate got his first one ever. So that was 
That was really cool. Um, that, and we marked that fish on the sounder before we caught it. But he's got, uh, what did he, had an elite FS unit in his boat. And, and I had a look at it and I said, what's happening here, mate? You know, have you got it set up? So, oh, mate, I don't know. It took two seconds because he had his side scan was on five metres. So when we're in 10 metres of water, so that's not working. So we pumped it out to 30 metres. I played around. I put turn fish reveal on, changed the palette colour to the one that I was talking about that I liked before, got all that sorted. And then later on, we saw some um, some birds working, some tailor busting up. I said to the boys, man, this is right on the tide chain. It's in Lake Macquarie. I said, if we're going to catch a mull away, this is the time. And then it was textbook. I tell you, it was... It was like the greatest guiding day of my life, Greg. I should retire now because I said, let's go and get under these birds. And my mate was throwing a little paddle tail vibe. And, yeah, he caught his first ever dewy on a vibe, which was just – the grin on his face was un unbelievable. It's really good. And we marked a dewy just before that. And uh, and I said to him, mate, they're here. He casting bang and he called one, which was great. So. Awesome stuff. All right, got a couple more questions. So – Josh is asking, it's a bit off topic. It's not off topic at all, mate. We're yeah. talking fishing, so it's all good. Uh, how often do you swap lures, CG, you know, from a soft vibe to a hard body to a plastic? Do you put in 10 casts until something hooks up or <laughs> what's, your, what's your process? It, it, Josh sounds like he's 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 a very active fisherman. I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm lucky that I, I would generally have a couple of rods rigged with different options. So, so um, and different times of the year. So soft vibes, for me, vibing is something that I do more in slightly deeper water in estuary systems at home or wherever I'm fishing. So that's more more a long cast, sink down, and, a, and something I'm doing vertically a bit more. So I would have a vibe rigged. I would have a soft plastic rigged. And then I've always got a, a stick bait or a, or a surface lure because that's to see a fish on the surface, either whether it be a popper or a stick bait, you know, any of that is just visually it's so stimulating to see the fish do that. So I've, I've got generally three options. So I've got those options, whether I'm fishing Lake Macquarie at home, whether I'm fishing off Coffs Harbour, uh, whether I'm fishing, you know, out of Gladstone, Townsville. It doesn't matter where I'm fishing. I, I've generally got either or even a metal jig that I can drop down fast. So we're talking before about uh, flying along and then suddenly marking something on the bottom. So then you go, wow, that looks pretty good. Spin around. How cool is it to have a metal jig that you can just go, oh, that looks drop down, ching, 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 bang, I'm on, and you catch a coral trout or you jig up a kingfish or, you know, it's a trevally or whatever it is. So mm. I, if you're lucky enough, Josh, to have a few rods, have them rigged, and it's much easier rather than cutting off and retying to go, oh, hang on, I'll just change and we'll have a go at that. You know, so. so how often would you swap rods there, mate? <laughs> Pretty regularly at the moment with these tackle manufacturers. Of, every time I turn around, there's a new rod and reel, which is, which is, you know, I, I'm not complaining for a minute because it's a great position to be in to have to be testing that gear. But um, no, pretty, pretty regularly. Uh, I, I think that um, you've got to think a little bit about water temperatures too. So um, different times of year, as the water temperature goes cooler, fish tend to slow down. Flathead are a classic example for it where we fish for them here in wintertime, well, I've caught them in 13 and a half degrees, 14 degrees of water. And and the bite is quite lazy. So the bite is quite slow and, oh, there's the weight and you've really got to set the hooks. Where in when the water's 26 or 27 degrees in the shallows, they, they, you know, they'll eat it like a maniac, <clears throat> excuse me, when the water's much warmer. So so that will dictate what sort of lures I use and, and the technique that I use a little bit. So if I've got to slow things down, I need a lure that works slower if that makes sense greg so there's no point having a lure that you've got to rip around to get the most out of it if the fish are, are a little bit shut down and a bit lazy too so think about that as well yeah i mean i tend to if, you, if you're seeing bait on the sound like we saw earlier on you're seeing bait that indicate that the fish are active and you've put in half a dozen casts and you, you know that the fish have seen it and haven't taken it well maybe it's time to put it yeah you know, just put something different in front of them it's one of my philosophy on it. Oh, exactly. If they're, yeah. if they're, but I guess, you know, you think about this barramundi are probably one of the, they, they could be the most frustrating things. <laughs> oh my God. People like me, we come, we, we live down south and we just want to come to Queensland. We're A, we're not allowed to come to Queensland at the moment, but anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but we want to go to Queensland and we want to catch a barramundi and then so I guess he's here, no worries. It's all locked jaw, everybody, right? They go around, they talk to each other and they don't want to play the game. So they can be one of those fish where, and you've seen it on, active target you can see the things just sitting there you can watch them following your vibes and looking at your at your suspending hard bodies and 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 not eat not eating it and quite often that can be nothing to do with your presentation it's just the fact that hey you've got to wait till 
you know, moon set, moon rise, a tide change, a weather change, something, low light conditions, a sun setting, and suddenly the bite happens. So you, you can you can throw every type of lure at them sometimes, but it's more about they're just arrogant, bloody things. <laughs> they, they just go, right, it's dinner time and I'll eat. And you've got to be, you've got to find the fish. So that's what we have our sounders for, electronics, find the fish, and then make sure that you're in the best spot to target those fish when they want to feed at times. And Barra are a classic example for that, I reckon. Yeah. And that's why, you know, all us folk up here in North Queensland, mate, we keep an eye on what's happening down south and we go, well, you do not, Greg. Oh, that's rubbish. Yeah, I don't believe that for a minute. Coming up, the barrow are going to be quiet. There's no point going out. May as well chase something else. So, oh. <laughs> so uh, Ian's asking about squid, mate. Do they mark on your sounder? Can you see them? Yep, absolutely. You can see them. Even the small arrow squid that we get in our local estuary system. Yeah, definitely you can see them. And it's interesting. One of the best things that anybody can ever do is is when you're catching fish or fighting a fish and you're down the back of the boat, swing around, have a look at the transducer. Oh, that's what a 80 centimetre kingfish looks like mid-water, you know, on, on my sounder. Once you work out that it's a kingfish, that's what a snapper looks like. That's what a what a tailor looks like. It's what a mackerel looks like. And the, the best way to visually have that connection between what's swimming around in the water and what's on your sounder is, 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 to, is to make that connection. Have a look and go, right hit that button, take a screenshot, save that screen, you know. That, and and uh, for me, I can look at my sounder now and and uh, look at Mulloway in, in my Lake Lestry systems, you know, whether it be Newcastle Harbour or Lake Macquarie, and I can generally, I can pick the size pretty close to within 10 centimetres of how big they are. I go, oh, that's the ones in the 70 to 80. That's all, oh, that's a metery. Wow, that's a big fish. That's metre, metre 20 in that sort of 10 to 20 centimetre range. Just through through catching them, looking at them on the sounder. And it's really cool when, when you can, you've can you got that confidence. It's very frustrating as well because even the guys I was out with today, they, they say, oh, I think we saw some dewies on the sounder. We're not too sure. Um, we took a photo on our phone. I'm looking at this phone shot. I'm going, oh, my God, they're sitting on this crazy school of really good dewies. <laughs> but luckily they didn't really know. They thought maybe they were. But if I'd seen those, I would have cried if I couldn't get a bite out of them, you know. So, yeah. so. So that having that knowledge can make you a little bit frustrated as an angler sometimes as well. Yeah, it's one thing to be able to find them and see them; it's another thing to be able to get them to yeah. take a bait or a little. So, um, uh, Joe is asking, mate, do you think active target would work for a burley session? Could you turn it backwards and see the fish swimming into the pilchard trail? Absolutely, a one hundred percent. I haven't uh, something of in the new series of real action that we start filming soon. We will be doing that exactly with. Uh, active target i'm looking forward to doing that um and that's a pretty cool thing um, i've had active target out when i've been mulloway fishing and, and and facing it backwards and you can cast a live yellow tail there and you can see the live yakka kicking there and and um and i haven't actually watched a dewey come up and eat it while i've been looking at it i've had another rod go off that was off to the side but but that's a pretty that's pretty cool and that's where active target is it just opens your eyes up um mm. it's, it's amazing what you can see and there's some great you know, Lawrence have got some fantastic videos of bass. I saw Dean Sylvester with some bass stuff the other day, again, with Active Target. He's pretty handy with that stuff as well. So so impairment fish like bass and yellow belly and and, um, and barramundi are all cool things to watch and, and see how they react. Um, and, and you can learn a lot about what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong by looking at what your lure is, where it's positioned, what depth it's at. Uh, first time I looked at it was with uh, Mark Olsen from uh, Lawrence in, in Lake Macquarie, Active Target. Um, we fitted it. He said, come out, we'll just have a quick, you know, I'll put my oil plates on because I hadn't used it before. And there's one of the sunken barges in Lake Macquarie. So we drove straight up there. Oh, this was really interesting and turned it on. And I went, oh, wow, look, look at that. And these two Jewies swam out from underneath the barge. And you can see on there through the through the, um, co the contours how big you can actually see how big the fish are. And that would have been two 90 centimetre mulloway. They swam out, had a look around and then went back underneath the barge. So then... If I was just using um, my conventional down scan and, and conventional sounder fixes and I drove across or drifted across there, I would have went, oh, there's two good fish. And then I would have went back again and said, well, they're gone. Where did they're they gone. go? Yeah. But I actually watched them swim out and go under the bar. So I knew that they didn't shoot off to the left or right or disappear. They were still there, but they'd gone back under the structure. And that's something that I couldn't see without active targets. Yeah, and of course, I mean, the huge difference between live sonar and, and traditional sonar is, you know, traditional sonar, you're seeing what you've already passed over, whereas live sonar, 
you're seeing it before it comes yeah. to you. So it's, hey, it's like, it's like looking at your bearded face right there, mate. It's all it's happening right in front of me. So that's that's the difference. It's not a still shot, but and that's and that is a you know that's a, a really good way to look at it. And um, yeah. And, and I think um, you know, I've got, got mates at you who use them um, further up the up your way, chasing uh, threadfin salmon and and barramundi and and mm. live baiting with live prawns when the fish are shut right down, and they're they're looking at the barra and dropping their live prawn within thirty centimeters of the face of the barra to catch it through through that whole system. It's almost like it's almost like an ultrasound is what it's like. You know, you can you, you can you can zone in so tight in, in what you want to do, which is pretty cool. Yeah, good stuff. Now, Dale's asked chirp versus traditional. I'm not sure exactly what the question is here, but um... yeah, we mentioned chirp there earlier. It's a ch chirp is something that I, I bring in once I get into that deeper water. So, um, so it, it's it's um, it's it's uh, it, it, you know it enhances the capabilities of, of what you're looking at. Really, is the way I'd like to look at it. So you might find you get out into with a traditional three one transducer, and you get out to 130 meters, and you're just going, oh, I wouldn't mind just having a bit more clarity on that. On, on, on what I'm looking at, but I like I like the you know I, I like what I'm looking at. Just want a bit more, and that's where you can switch up to medium chirp and high chirp. It just punches through a bit harder and, and, and can clean that picture up for you again. So yeah, yep, okay. Question about mounting a transducer. So is mounting a transducer level essential given the swell immediately puts your transducer all over the place? Yeah, definitely because. Um, because at the end of the day, you've got to have a you've got to have a level starting point. So your boat might be rocking around, but if it's, it's sitting over there, it's going to be really bad when it when, when your boat kicks that way. So, one hundred percent, you want it level. Um, you want to make sure that that it's that you mount it in a place where it's it's got really good clean water flow. So hydrodynamically, I love saying that. It's only because I know what it means. But anyway, so you want really good water flow over that transducer. And, and generally, I like to have it probably about a three or four degree kick down. So the back of the transducer is just sitting lower than the front of it. So that water pressure has to flow over the face of the transducer. That makes a really big difference. And then make sure that when, when you mount it, even if you buy... You know, you've bought yourself an aluminium boat. Just have a bit of a look. If it, if it, if uh, at the bottom there, it's not a plate boat, but it's welded. You might want to just run the file and and run a bit of emery paper and and just linish that so it's nice and smooth. So there's not a dag of weld that's creating a bit of a whirlpool of of disturbed water that's running over that transducer. Is another big one. Well, there's a pro tip for you. I love that one. Awesome. So, uh, rare Aussie, do you have a favourite colour plastic, or does it depend on conditions? No, I have a favourite colour. Absolutely, I have a favourite colour. So in that in that Berkeley uh, in the in, in the Gulp range, it's got to be blue pepper neon for me. Like it is just a it's a colour. And I know you catch fish on the lures that you're casting, but man, I've caught some fantastic snapper on that colour. And it's that real slimy, mackerel, shimmery sort of colour that just seems to work so well. So I I. I'm a big fan. If I've got, if I'm going in a snapper comp tomorrow, and and I have to take one colour lure, that's the lure I'm taking. So, if we're, if we're to New Zealand and, and we're using jandals and chili burns, we're on the nuclear chicken. But no, we're on the, I'm on the blue pepper leon. That's my favourite colour. So. Awesome stuff. I think this is the last of our questions, guys. So Ian's asking whether you need the memory card in the slot before you can take a screenshot. No, you do not. So the. the um, the unit will house those screenshots, so so you can take those. But then you do need to insert um, a, a memory card in there to download those screenshots, and then put them on the on on your PC or your, your computer, like we have done tonight. So, but it will it will house those, and they will not. You can't save your um, screenshots to your CMAP card either. You know, so yeah, so you do need just, right, your, your expensive data. No, no, no. So just get a little eight. You only need a little eight gig cards, plenty. So don't go too big. If you buy a hundred and twenty eight gig card or some stupid card size, um, quite often they're too big and and they don't work that no, well. Yeah. Yeah. No, so eight to thirty two will 32, work. I think. I think is, yeah. yeah, but sixteen gig, eight gigs, plenty. So just buy a little, and they're, they're pretty cheap to buy now anyway. So. Yeah. That's it, mate. I think we've uh, we've run these guys out of questions. You've done a great job. It's been a, it's been a great That's session. I've learned a few things along the way, so it got me inspired to, to go and catch a snapper next time I'm down south. Oh, we've got another question come through. Here we go. Let's just uh, let's just knock this one over. Is mounting a transducer backwards beneficial, or is that a myth? Somebody was telling me the other day that they had mounted their transducer backwards. So that's. That somebody is who was telling I can't even think who it was had mounted it backwards. 
I'll get to you. I've never done it. So I, I, I put my hand up there. I, I, I don't, I can't, uh, I can't, with, oh, it's a mate of mine up the coast has turned his around and mounted it on the bottom of his boat because what you do get, you do get um, with with side scan when you're punching out, especially if you're driving up and down river systems looking for schools of Mulloway out of the riverbeds or rock walls, you will get um, uh, a, a black spot because you've transduced on one side and then you've got the leg of your engine, so it can't shoot as well through past there. So you've got to trim your engine right up, so trim your engine up into sort of shallow water drive a little bit just so it gets that clean shoot both ways. Um, but my mate has actually mounted it to the bottom, he's three-in-one transducer to the bottom of his boat, and then he gets a perfect screenshot and he turned it around and mounted it backwards. So there you go. You can do it, and I've been in his boat, and it reads fantastically well, so there you go. It doesn't give you reverse readings or anything like that. <laughs> well, you've got it. It will. It will. You can tell. You can change in the menu for side scan um, what side you're looking at. So you will have to turn that around. So that's easy enough to do when you get in the menu of side scan. So yeah, if you if you just turn it around without changing that, it will say that the left's right, the right's left. But you can change that around in the menu. So. Yeah. All right. Cool. And last question, guys. Uh, Kyle's asked. Uh, any AT updates coming out soon? Uh, not sure. Don't know. That's a question. I, I don't know the answer to that one either. Yeah, I'm not sure. But there's quite often um, updates for you for your for your sound if you're electronics, and just got to keep an eye on those on the Lawrence website. So I'm not sure. I think we're pretty up to date at the moment with all that. So um, so that's active target he's talking about there. So yeah. I'm I'm not sure, Kyle. We'll have to have a look. But I will be checking that out as well. So yeah. excellent stuff. Hey, mate, I think we are probably done for the night. So I think uh, you can go and rest your voice. Uh, no worries. We're going to thank everybody for coming along and for asking some great questions. Apologies again for the late uh, start. Glad that you all still made it along. And uh, Guesty, we've got another uh, Sonar Masterclass coming up on the 6th of December, 2022. I think we might have... Oh, and I can't remember who we've got now, but we've uh, got another post one. Somebody really important. It might be Jace Ehrlich, I reckon. might be Jace Ehrlich. And oh, might Jace. Be Coastal yeah. live uh, sonar, active uh, sonar. So that should be a good session. So keep that one, uh, keep that date open, 8 o'clock on the 6th of December. But for now, thank you all for the, uh, the questions. Thank you, Guesty, for coming along and answering the questions. We will see you next time. Have a good night. No problems. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks, Greg.